Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. So let's go ahead and uh, go ahead and turn to Proverbs 4, 2. Proverbs 4, 2. And while you're doing that, let me explain the title because this is an unusual title. Some of my titles can be a little strange. Uh, not as bad as my associate pastor when I was pastoring in Salisbury in 1980. He had a message that I absolutely loved. His message, the title of his message, he got up one Sunday evening and said, tonight, he had a real deep voice, he said, tonight I'm going to preach on faith that doesn't just float by. <laughs> and I said, what? <laughs> but it was a really good message. It was one of my favorite messages of his. And uh, his point was is that a lot of people, when they begin to operate in the faith walk, they just kind of, kind of operate in faith. They take stabs at it. And he said, you got to have faith that doesn't just float by. you got to really be grounded in your faith. And it was a really good message. So you never can judge a message by its title necessarily, as they say about books and their covers. Uh, but to explain the title, i got to explain a little bit of the terminology. If you are a part of a group, whether it's a political group or whether it's uh, Christians and there are various groups and denominations and such as that, uh, there's a term called your camp. Okay? Your camp are the people that believe like you do. And they're, they're your group. You know, they're your kindred spirits, if you will. And uh, so when we talk about somebody in our camp, we're not talking about just... Well, they happen to be Christians, okay? They're people who really identify with us. You know, today, in, in my terminology at least, I would call them word of faith people. You know, they're charismatic, they speak in other tongues, they believe the word of God, they're strong on the word of God, or at least they should be. <laughs> and so they're in our camp, all right? Well, the title of this is, There Are Squirrels in the Camp. <laughs> so there you go. Sets the mood right there. All right, so there are squirrels in the camp. Well, the thing about a squirrel is, now you know what, when we call it, when we say a squirrel, squirrels tend to be flighty. You know, they, they're nervous. They jump around a lot. You see their tail twitching all the time. You know, you, you know what a squirrel's like. Well, the thing is, if their tails are twitching and they chitter at you and they bounce around, is probably a squirrel. So we recognize squirrels in the camp because they're squirrely. <laughs> all right? Now, <laughs> I say all this because, oh, several months ago, I was in a meeting. I'm not going to say where, but I was in a meeting. And a particular minister got up to teach. And he began to teach. And as he taught, now, I had heard him before, and he was good. But as I heard him teach, I thought, something's not right. This is not sound doctrine. And in my spirit, I kid you not, I heard the Lord say, there are squirrels in the camp. <laughs> and I said, you know, Lord, you're right. And so as I meditated on that a bit, <laughs> I began to do some study. And here's another thing that, that those of you that if you're teaching, if you're in the ministry, have been for some time, let me give you some advice. Don't teach something the very first time it gets dropped in your spirit. Don't just jump up and teach it. Let it sit there. <laughs> Let it kind of simmer a while. You know, work on some finding some scripture to back up your indignation. <laughs> okay? So when the Lord said there's squirrels in the camp, I, my first impulse was to just preach that message. So I've let it sit now for months. So, let's get into Proverbs 4, 2. For I give you good doctrine, forsake ye not my law. Today, we would call it the Word. As a matter of fact, God's Word translation, you, you're going to hear me using God's Word translation. If you don't have access to that, I'd suggest a couple of things. Get eSword, e-sword.net, okay? Get that, and then download the God's Word translation module. It's free. Okay, so you don't have to pay anything for it. 
But God's Word translation gives you some interesting insights into the translation of Scripture. God's Word translation for Proverbs 4.2 says, After all, I have taught you well. Do not abandon my teachings. I like that. I have taught you well. I've given you sound doctrine. Now, before we get into much else, doctrine is a word that when we hear it, we think religion. We think religious doctrine. The word doctrine in Greek is basically just translating instruction or teaching. That's all it is. It's not heavy-handed religious stuff. It's just teaching. It's, it's understanding from what we have heard taught us to us. All right, <clears throat> so he says, I've given you good doctrine, forsake you not my law or my word, or as, as I said here, I've taught you well, do not abandon my teachings. All right, Ephesians 4.11. Ephesians 4.11 says he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. This is the list of what we call the five-fold ministry. And in fact, if you count them off, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, those are the five ministry gifts. So why were we given this gift of ministry gifts? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now I, know, I think it's interesting to realize that what he's saying here is he didn't give the five ministry gifts to do the work of the ministry and edify the body of Christ. He gave the five ministry gifts to build up the saints, perfect or mature the saints, so the saints could do the work of the ministry. So the saints could edify each other in the body of Christ. Till we all come in the unity of the faith. Now, you know, I've been reading this scripture now for pert now to 40 some odd years. <laughs> probably longer because I'm about to turn 60. So probably much longer than that. So, but the unity of the faith, every time I've heard that phrase and every th time I've read that scripture, I've thought, Lord, that would take a miracle. <laughs> and in fact, it probably will. But... The unity of the faith is what we will come into before Jesus comes back. So something's going to happen to bring us into the unity of the faith. Now this is not the unity of everybody that's just born again being born again. This is the unity of the faith until we come to this point of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect or mature man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's not a low level. That's a fairly high level, if you get my drift. So this unity of the faith is something that I believe we're, we're in the last of the last days. I'm convinced of that. So since we're in the last of the last days, we're going to see the unity of the faith. Which means God, God's got to bring it to pass between now and when the Lord comes back, which is a short time. So, wow, that's going to be something to see. That's going to be a miracle. And it means we've got to get busy doing what we're called to do because we're part of this. We're part of, of this unity of the faith coming about. Now, when the unity of the faith comes about, what happens? That we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine. Children in the faith, that's what he's talking about here, are tossed to and fro. They're carried about by winds of doctrine. By the slight of men, there are men out there who are out to deceive the body of Christ. It is their purpose to deceive the body of Christ. Cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. There are people out there that are intentionally wanting to deceive the body of Christ. And there's young Christians that are tossed to and fro by these doctrines. But rather, we want to come to the point of speaking the truth in love, growing up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. That's the goal we're shooting for. But unfortunately, I'm seeing, because there are squirrels in the camp, that means that there are ministers that were solid on the word of faith message that have drifted so far off that they've gotten squirrely. They've been tossed to and fro and carried about by winds of doctrine, by people who are lying in wait to deceive. And I'm sure we could name off a few teachers that we know of that unfortunately are teaching false doctrine. Now, I'd advise you, if you know who they are, mark them, as we'll find out here later, mark them because you need to avoid them. If you know they're teaching false doctrine, don't listen to them. Don't listen to them out of a false sense of, well, they used to be good. Well, yeah, they used to be good. Praise the Lord for that. I, I trust they come back, you know, and get, and get straight. But until then, they're squirrely. So don't listen to them. 
All right, 1 Timothy 1.3. This is out of the King James. As I besought thee to abide at Ephesus when I went unto Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Okay? Now let's go to the God's Word translation. And actually, I'm going to start in verse 1 of 1 Timothy 1 for the God's Word translation. From Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the command of God our Savior and Jesus Christ our confidence, to Timothy, a genuine child in faith, goodwill, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Jesus Christ our Lord are yours. Here's that verse. When I was going to the province of Macedonia, I encouraged you to stay in the city of Ephesus. That way you could order certain people to stop teaching false doctrine. I love the way that reads in the God's Word translation. Notice what he says. This is, he's talking to Timothy, who's a young minister. Somebody that Paul instructed and that he brought up in the faith. He knows Timothy is solid. He knows, as he says here, I like this, a genuine child in faith. He really is, he's right on the beam. But he says, I want you to go to Ephesus and I want you to order certain people to stop teaching false doctrine. Wow, what an assignment. I want you to go order them. Stop teaching false doctrine. Have you noticed that in the early church, I mean, this is, this is somewhat after the beginning of the church. This is years later. But it's still what we would call the early church. Have you noticed that they didn't really pull punches back then? You know, this whole business of, well, brother, you've got to operate in love. You, you know, telling Timothy, go and order them to stop teaching false doctrine, that, that just doesn't sound like ooey-gooey, wishy-washy, yeah. you know, lovey-dovey stuff like we hear taught today, unfortunately. No, he said, look, order them. <laughs> Put them straight. He, goes, he says, this way you could order certain people to stop teaching false doctrine and occupying themselves with myths and endless genealogies. These myths and genealogies raise a lot of questions rather than promoting God's plan, which centers in faith. Hallelujah. Not squirrely doctrine. Faith. My goal in giving you this order is for love to flow from a pure heart, from a clear conscience, and from a sincere faith. Some people have left these qualities behind and have turned to useless discussions. <laughs> now, a lot of what I heard this guy teach, that guy, when I heard the, the Lord say, there are squirrels in the camp, they were strange, useless discussions. Things that just might as well have not been said, in fact. So this is exactly the kind of thing he's talking about. They've turned to useless discussions. They want to be experts in Moses' teachings. Hello, that's exactly what this guy was saying. I am an expert in Moses' teachings, in effect. Okay? Matter of fact, he was big on saying that we had to learn it a certain way according to rabbinical study. Yeah. Uh, no. <laughs> we are in the New Covenant, which is New Testament. <laughs> Praise the Lord for the Old Covenant and the Old Testament. We can study that. We learn things from it. But that's not where we're at. <laughs> so anyway, they want to be experts in Moses' teachings. However, they don't under understand what they're talking about or the things about which they speak so confidently. We know that Moses' teachings are good if they were used as they were intended to be used. Amen? For example, a person must realize that laws are not intended for people that have God's approval. Laws are intended for lawbreakers breakers and rebels, for ungodly people and sinners, for those that think nothing is holy or sacred, for those that kill their fathers, their mothers, or other people. Laws are intended for people involved in sexual sins, for homosexuals. This is God's Word translation. For kidnappers, for liars, for those who lie when they take an oath, and for whatever else is against accurate teachings. So all of this that he's talking about, this, he's saying, now see, this is a current teaching that is in the body of Christ right now, is that we Christians are under the law. Meaning, we don't have to obey the word of God. We can just go live however we want to live. Well, here is Paul telling Timothy, a young minister, look, these guys that think they're right and, are, and believe that they're walking according to this 
you know, this teaching, they're teaching that, that law is not for us. But law what is for people who are breaking the law. People who are against the Word of God. People who are against accurate teachings, he says here in verse 10. Verse 11, Moses' teachings were intended to be used in agreement with the good news that contains the glory of the blessed God. I was entrusted with that good news. I thank Jesus Christ our Lord that he has trusted me and has appointed me to do his work, work with the strength he's given me. In the past, I cursed him. I persecuted him. I acted arrogantly toward him. However, I was treated with mercy because I acted ignorantly in my unbelief. The Lord was very kind to me. Through his kindness, he brought me to faith and gave me love that Jesus Christ shows his people. This is a statement that can be trusted and deserves complete acceptance. Jesus Christ came in the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost sinner. However, I was treated with mercy so that Jesus Christ could use me, the foremost sinner, to demonstrate his patience. This patience serves as an example to those who would believe him and live forever. Praise the Lord. Now, he took false doctrine that were, was being taught in his day and turned it. I love the way Paul writes. The way he takes words. He just works with them. <laughs> and he says, look, I used to be a sinner and the law did apply to me. Now I'm born again. Now I'm in line with the word of God. And now I'm not bound because I've been set free. I like what I heard Keith Boris say recently. He was talking about the scripture that said, and this was from a, I forget the translation that, that he was reading from, but it says that repentance is a gift. And he, he centered up on that, he started teaching on that, repentance is a gift. And he says, we have lost sight of that truth, that repentance is a gift. If you sin, what you want to do is repent. You know, yeah, I'm born again, but if I miss it now and sin, first thing I want to do is repent. I like what I heard Brother Kenneth Copeland say. Don't run from God when you sin, run to Him. Repent. Be quick to repent. And Brother Moore was teaching, repentance is a gift. And he read it out, of, I wish I could remember the translation, but he read it out of a particular translation that actually said that. And he said the thing about it is people don't want to repent. They, they push repentance away from them. They reject repentance. When in fact it's the greatest gift God has given, and it's one we should embrace. I thank God I can repent. I thank God I can confess my sin and Jesus Christ is ready, willing, and able right then to forgive me of my sin and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Now once I have repented, once I've gotten it straight, now I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus and I can live in that. And I know a lot of people say, well, yes, but Dr. Bill, whether or not you have sinned at a particular moment, if you're a Christian, then you are the righteousness of God in Christ. You've been made the righteousness of God. Yes, that's true, positionally. But as Pastor likes to say, experientially, <laughs> we need to exercise that righteousness. How do we do that? By repenting, getting straight with God, getting right with God, and then we live in our righteousness. Then we can fully use all the rights and privileges that God has given us. All right, so what we need to do. 1 Timothy 4.16. Check yourself. This is what I wrote in my notes. Check yourself. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine or the teaching. Continue in them. For in doing this thou shalt save thyself and them that hear thee. I love that. Take heed and check yourself out as to whether you are in the doctrine. So we need to check ourselves out and make sure we're solidly in the camp of faith. All right? We don't want to be one of those squirrels in the camp. We want to be solid as a rock. Continue in them. I like that. Now, Romans 10, 17 talks about, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And I was listening to a teaching, literally, that I did back in the 80s. And it was, I was listening to myself. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Because you, if, if, you, if it's been that long since it was taught, might as well be somebody else teaching it, you know? <laughs> so I was listening to myself, and I said, yeah, you know, I used to quote... Romans uh, chapter 10, verse 17. So then faith comes by hearing God's word. And I had somebody walk up to me and say, well, now, wait a minute, that's not what it says. And I said, what do you mean? And I went back and looked at it, and it says, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I said, oh, yeah, well, that, that's true. It does say that. 
So I thought, well, why does it say it that way? You know, God doesn't use words haphazardly. You know what I'm saying? He says things a certain way. So I said, I'm going to do a study on that. I'm going to find out what that really means. So I found out that so then faith cometh by hearing. The word hearing there is the Greek word akoe, A-K-O-E. Akoe, it means more than the mere sense of hearing, but implies hearing and receiving the teaching. So in my ignorance at the time <laughs> of reading it as faith comes by hearing the word of God, if you look at it that way, you could go get the Bible on cassette and just play it and faith would come. Right? That's the way I would think, having taught it that way. But after I got this little correction, this little course correction, I realized faith comes by hearing, which is more than the mere sense of hearing on the, the ears on the side of your head, but implies hearing and receiving the teaching. And the hearing and receiving of the teaching comes by the Word of God. See, that's the way we can take this apart and put it back together. Faith comes by more than the mere sense of hearing, but hearing and receiving teaching. And that hearing and receiving teaches comes by the Word of God. So basically, the way this scripture works is if we hear good teaching of the Word of God. And really that fits in with chapter 10 of Romans much better anyway. He says, how shall they hear without a preacher? He's not... Now, I understand, before I say this, I understand they didn't have cassettes back in these days. <laughs> you know, but there I was back in the 70s with cassette tapes. And so I was thinking in terms of hearing the Bible on cassette and faith was going to come. Faith was just going to magically drop on my head if I just heard the Bible. But really, Romans chapter 10 says, how shall they hear without a preacher? How shall that preacher be preaching to them unless that preacher is sent? So he's talking about ministry. We just read the five-fold ministry earlier. All of that five-fold ministry have been sent here to minister to us to teach us, to bring us up in the faith. It's hearing that teaching that causes faith to come. Not, let me say this, not that listening to the Bible on cassette is a bad thing, or CD, or MP3, or however it is you want to listen. Perfectly fine to listen to the Bible. But the system works by hearing and receiving teaching of the Word of God. There's something about, you know, the, the Bible talks about the foolishness of preaching. There's something about that supernaturally that's going on. So when I hear Brother Hagin on those old classic tapes, which have been converted to MP3s, that I'm listening to, something in those words supernaturally causes faith to arise in my heart. And I'd much rather hear him teach. Now, he may use the same scriptures over and over. He may use the same old stories. But there's something about that that when I hear it, my spirit gets quickened. And I go, yeah. And I tell you what, we, we, uh, <clears throat> we've got a, a little radio that Blend and I have beside the bed. <clears throat> and it's a Wi-Fi radio. It actually receives Wi-Fi from the, the network. And then we listen to Word of Faith radio. Well, there's two Word of Faith radio stations. There's Word of Faith the regular station, and then there's Word of Faith, the healing channel. So 24-7, 365, the healing channel is, is doing healing teaching. And so I like to turn that thing on and just let it play all night. So it's preaching to me. You know, and the thing is, when you're, when you're about half asleep and Brother Hagin is preaching the word to you, it just goes straight into your spirit. I don't know what it is. I just go, yeah, and I just really get some things out of it. So we got Brother Hagin, a lot of his old you know, messages on healing. We got Keith Moore, all of his teaching on healing. And there's a lot of Keith Moore teaching on healing because he taught you know, at Rama in the healing school. So he has a lot of teaching on healing. So all of that's in there. And it's all playing. It's interspersed with a little music and a little station ID once in a while. And, and I'm just hearing that teaching. So I'm hearing teaching of the Word of God by anointed ministers. And I'm telling you, since we started doing this, we've been doing it now for probably a couple months, I'd say. It's just been building us up to hear that word taught. Now, check yourself. We said, take heed unto yourself and unto the doctrine, what teaching you're listening to. Continue in what you know is true. Now, 1 Timothy 6, 3. 
This is where it gets a little serious. <laughs> If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the doctrine which is according to godliness. Now let's read that out of the Good News translation. All right? Good News says, Whoever teaches false doctrine and doesn't agree with the accurate words of our Lord Jesus Christ and godly teaches is a conceited person. He shows that he doesn't understand anything. Squirrels <laughs> that are in the camp. You don't understand anything. You think you're such a hot shot. But you're not. Rather, he has an unhealthy desire to argue and quarrel about words. This produces... See, this kind of false doctrine teaching produces something. It produces jealousies, rivalry, cursing, and suspicion and conflict between people whose corrupt minds have been robbed of the truth. They think that a godly life is a way to make profit. In other words, they're basically preaching for the wrong reasons. They're preaching for profit. So, Timothy, uh, excuse me, Titus, I'm sorry, Titus chapter 2 verse 1 says, But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Speak the things that become sound doctrine. We ought to be speaking only the Word of God. We ought to be speaking the Word on a day-to-day -day basis. And those things that become sound doctrine, how do we do that? By hearing the Word concerning sound doctrine. All right, now let's look at uh, 2 Timothy 4.3. For the time will come, and I submit that it's now, when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust they shall heat to themselves teachers having itching ears, God's Word translation, we ready for this? <laughs> uh, 2 Timothy 4, 2, back up one, in God's Word translation. Be ready to spread the Word whether, it's, whether or not the time is right. Point out errors, uh-oh, warn people, and encourage them. Be very patient when you teach. A time will come when people will not listen to accurate teachings. Instead, they will follow their own desires and surround themselves with teachers who will tell them what they want to hear. Sound like a familiar time? People ref will refuse to listen to the truth and turn to myths. But you must keep a clear head in everything. Endure suffering. Do the work of a missionary. Devote yourself completely to your work. And I submit this is what we need to be doing in this day that we know is full of people that are squirrely. <laughs> where the squirrels are in the camp. Well, we need to keep a clear head. We need to be speaking the things which become sound doctrine. Or in other words, speak the things that are true and accurate teachings of the Word of God. Keep a clear head in everything. Endure suffering. And, and I grant you this, if you're teaching the uncompromising Word of God and not pulling any punches, and the rest of the world's all listening to itching ear teaching, <laughs> squirrely teaching, there will be some persecution. Now, what he says in your suffering, he's really talking about the persecution side of things. You know, you don't endure sickness and disease. You believe God and get healed. You don't endure poverty. You believe God and get out of poverty. But the persecution that comes, Jesus said that that is what we would see in the last days, in these days, and that is people would persecute us. So endure that kind of suffering. Do the work of a missionary. We are to go out into the world. The world needs it now more than ever. Devote yourself completely to the work. Those that are on sound doctrine, and I'm, I'm believing that what we're seeing is that it is sadly a smaller minority that are really holding to the sound doctrine and teaching the sound doctrine in the face of all the other mess that's being taught. We need to devote ourselves completely to the Word because we're the hope. And I am very inclusive here. We that are teaching sound doctrine are the hope for the body of Christ to get back in line and get that unity of the faith that we're shooting for. Now, 2 John 1, 9. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any to you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. 
Now let's read that out of the God's Word translation. Everyone who doesn't teach what Christ taught doesn't have God. Wow. The person who continues to teach what Christ taught has both the Father and Son. If anyone comes to you and doesn't bring these teachings, don't take him into your home or even greet him. Whoever greets him shares the evil things he's doing. Now the greeting they're talking about is an Eastern greeting. Not just saying hi. <laughs> you know, it's an Eastern greeting where you're, you're essentially inviting them into your home and feeding them and listening to what they have to say and really partaking of, in whatever fellowship there is with them. And I remember one time, <clears throat> or some about being in your 20s and early 30s, being in the ministry, hallelujah, you just do it. You know what I'm saying? You don't pull any punches. And so I had just read this scripture. You, you can see where this is going. And I had, in my ministry, I had a, an office. And it was right on the little highway there. It, was in, you know, it wasn't an interstate highway. It was like a country road. Number eight, you know, down toward Denton. Number eight, but this office was right off at of number eight. You could see it from the road. And it had my ministry <laughs> sign up there, you know, Healing Springs Faith Center. This is when we had our church down there. And so I was sitting in my office, and I read this scripture, and there was a knock on the door. Knock, knock, knock. <laughs> I opened the door, and there's a guy standing there with his, you know, whatever it was, Jehovah's Witness thing, <laughs> and all of his materials may I come in and talk to you about God? And I said, no. He went, what? <laughs> I mean, he, he was used to everybody just inviting him in and sitting down and getting into a discussion. I said, no. He said, why not? I said, well, I was just reading my Bible. Can I get it and show it to you? You stay right there. <laughs> sure. So I go get my Bible, I bring it over, and I, sh I read him this verse that says... If any man come to you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, nor bid him Godspeed. He goes, okay. I said, you're not teaching the, the pure word of God. You're teaching a lie. And so I can't invite you into my house or my office. Okay? He goes, okay. <laughs> Can I leave you a book? I said, I'll take yours if you'll take mine. So he said, uh, okay. So I gave him a, a thing. I thought, what was it? Brother Copeland came out with, you know, welcome to the family that has all the basic scriptures in it and so forth. I gave him that and I took his. And he got back in his car and drove off. And I tore his little thing up, took it and put it in the burning barrel. We had a burning barrel outside. They're back in the country. You know, you can do that. Had a burning barrel. I tore it up, put it in the burning barrel and set it on fire. Went back into my office. <laughs> You know, and I couldn't help but think about this guy going, he wouldn't even let me in. <laughs> I can almost guarantee he read that book because he wouldn't know what kind of squirrely thing this was. He wouldn't even let me in the house. So, a new evangelistic tool for your arsenal. <laughs> okay. So when it says whoever greets him, don't, don't be concerned that you waved at him. You know, it's talking about an Eastern greeting here, okay? Just want to make that clear. All right, a couple more scriptures. Revelation 2, 14. This is Jesus talking to the churches. Jesus, <laughs> king, head of the church. He says, but I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and commit fornication. He said, I got a few things against you. You listen to false teaching. Whoa. I kind of believe that Jesus is saying the same thing to a lot of Christians today. I got a couple of things I want to talk to you about. Verse 15 uh, of Revelation 2. So hast thou also them that hold to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which I hate. He hated false doctrine. Jesus, head of the church, hates. Wait a minute now, hold on. Jesus is love. Yes, he is. And he hates false doctrine. See, false doctrine is not something we play with. False doctrine is something we reject. 
and we stand against. So he says, hey, these, these Nicolaitans that are teaching these things, I hate that teaching. Repent. There's that word. Repent. It's a gift. Or else I will come unto thee click quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Wow. Well, what's the sword of his mouth? The word. What do we do? We use the sword of our mouth, the word of God, to fight against false doctrine. Because if you don't, I will come and do it myself, he says. Well, I plan to be one of those swinging the sword. All right? Revelation 2.24. But unto you I say unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as, as have not this doctrine, in other words, are not in false doctrine, and which have not known the depths of, of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you no other burden. In other words, I don't have anything else to say to you guys because you guys are holding the, the, to the truth. So I don't want Jesus saying, look, I got a couple of things I need to talk to you about, okay? I want him to say, you guys, I'm not going to put any other burden on you because you guys are holding to the truth. I'd much rather be in that position. So how do we do that? Don't have the false doctrine. Don't know the depths of Satan, which means stand out of sin. As they speak, I will put none upon, no, upon you no other burden. So praise the Lord. I believe that we now know, at least have some insight into what to do when there are squirrels in the camp. We don't play with them. See, the problem with squirrels, sometimes they look cute. But you know what? Squirrels are rodents. They've got ticks and fleas and grunge and dirt. They may look cute from a distance, but only from a distance. Squirrels can hurt you. you. You try to grab one, man, they will cut you with their little teeth. You know, and they're liable to you get all kinds of diseases, get rabies from them. I mean, stay away from squirrels in the natural. But in the spiritual, same thing. They can hurt you. They can get you off doctrinally. So when you, you hear a squirrel, <laughs> then, oh boy, there's squirrels in the camp. I'm not listening to this teaching. And then, get them out of there. Now, in this particular meeting, that's what occurred. <laughs> they had a shot, they left. <laughs> and I guarantee you, they probably won't be back until at least we know that they're back on the Word. Now, here's the thing about it. We want people to get back on the Word. We want them to repent and come back and get solid. And once they do, praise the Lord, that's great. But I still wouldn't listen to them for a while. Not until someone with authority and understanding has cleared them <laughs> for me to listen to them. That's why we have pastors. Praise the Lord. Because they watch for our souls. And the word soul there is suke, my will and emotions. They keep us even in the soulish realm. Obviously there is our, our, there are our spiritual guide and director in that sense. But I tell you what, they are there for your mental health as well. Praise the Lord. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.